Hello and most welcome to 1766 of the Heidegger series. We will today continue where we left off in 1764 with Stephen G. Affel's a fantastic article, Captivating Pictures and Liberating Language. We mentioned last time that Affel made a, a very important, seemingly small adjustment of the famous, if a lion were to talk, we wouldn't understand what he would say. And it's not so much that maybe the language would be different, it's more that his life world would be uh, so entirely alien to ours. So that's why we wouldn't understand him. And Kalle made a really funny comment there that the example, I am going to eat you, is not the best by uh, Affelt, and I do agree. Uh, but we still, I think we get his meaning anyway. But this is not, <laughs> doesn't make, makes much sense. This is how it goes when an academia writes about animals. But this also goes to show that it's in the connection, as we mentioned earlier, this is related to telling. It is also widely related to the idle picture or the idle thought when it blooms, so to speak, when there is a movement and it starts to signify. It starts to have meaning. Before that, it has only dictionary meaning. It doesn't have established, firmly set meaning. The better examples here is suitable mate, habitat and the like, where to find the best antelope and such and such. Uh, it would be widely different from anything that we can imagine. And we can continue to read. We are currently at page 276 at the very last paragraph. It takes some time, this article, because the font is pretty small. But we are closing to the end. The considerations that I've sketched are meant to suggest that a lion that talks, that utter words, cannot be understood as projecting the ground of his intelligibility in uttering the words that he does when, when he does, and so cannot be understood as speaking at all. But if a lion cannot be understood, as projecting the ground of his intellig intelligibility in talking, then again, however clearly we may understand the dictionary meanings of the individual words. that he utters, 
we will not be able to understand what he is saying with those words. We will not be able to understand him. And if we cannot understand him, what he is saying with the words that he utters, then the words will express no determinate meaning. They will not themselves serve one thing rather than another. Conclusion. At this point, I believe that we begin to appreciate what for Wittgenstein is ultimately involved in our drive to produce for ourselves a picture of language as operating through pictures which carry determinant meaning entirely within themselves as well as something of the morally redemptive character of his efforts to counter this view. At paragraph 117, and in so close connection with his discussion in paragraphs 113 and 15 of our self-captivating and self-bewitching efforts to produce this picture of language Wittgenstein remarks, you say to me, you understand this expression, don't you? Well then, I am using it in the sense you are familiar with. As if the sense were an atmosphere accompanying the word which is carried with it into every kind of application. The idea that sense is an atmosphere that accompanies a word as well as the closely related idea 
that language operates through pictures which carry their own meaning are not for Wittgenstein simply philosophical mistakes. They are fantasies. which express our desire in particular Wittgenstein's treatments of these ideas reveals them to be specific manifestations of a desire to escape or to repudiate the human conditions of meaning and intelligibility in language that I have been sketching. We might understand the desire to escape these conditions as a wish for meaning and intelligibility freed from dependence upon our agreement in judgment and made secure from the vicissitudes of our ability to find and our desire to find our feet with one another. We might also understand our desire to escape these conditions as a wish for meaning and intelligibility apart from the revelation of ourselves and our individual positions in speaking upon which intelligibility depends and as a wish for understanding others apart from the work of understanding them apart from the work of discovering and appreciating their positions circumstances and purposes. Wittgenstein, I believe, wants us to recognize that each of these accounts of our desire is correct. Each captures something of what we want 
and something of what we want to evade in our drive toward a fantasy of language as operating according to our conception of pictures. However, I believe that at this point, we can also see that for Wittgenstein, our drive to repudiate the human conditions of meaning and intelligibility in language is nothing less than a drive to repudiate or to escape our conditioned human nature. It is a drive to repudiate or to escape the fact that not everything and anything can be meaningfully said at any time and to anybody. that speaking meaningfully depends upon taking up and revealing a comprehensible position in speaking and that what may be a comprehensible position will depend upon the circumstances in which one is speaking upon those with whom one is speaking and upon possessing with others a shared sense of possibilities and of significance. That what strikes us as significant or can comprehensively be shown to be significant depends upon facts about our world. Facts about our specific bodily nature and facts about the nature and texture of our lives together and much more. In the passages that I have been discussing, Wittgenstein is concerned to show specifically that and how in our drive to repudiate our conditioned human nature through producing a picture of language as operating according to our conception of pictures, we bewitch our own intel intelligence.
first we captivate ourselves through our repetitive efforts to produce this picture of language and to fix it before ourselves. Through our making ourselves captive to the construction of this picture, we come to feel as though the picture holds us captive, as though we cannot get outside of it. We project the picture into language and then language seems to repeat it to us inexorably. Second, the picture that we work to give ourselves, a picture intended to secure meaning and intelligibility in language beyond or apart from our human conditions of meaning and intelligibility precisely undermines the possibility of meaning and intelligibility. For severing the connection between our words and our individual purposes in using those words in particular circumstances. It leaves our words in a specific sense empty. They are not devoid of dictionary meaning. but they are powerless to say anything. I began this essay with Wittgenstein's remark that philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. I have been arguing throughout that ordinary language is not the source of our bewitchment. Rather, I have argued we bewitch ourselves and we become lost to ourselves in confusion, emptiness, and unintelligibility through our drive to repudiate our condition, human nature, by seeking to escape the human conditions on meaning and 
intelligibility in language. Accordingly, our liberation from this bewitchment, our restoration to ourselves and to our intelligibility will depend upon our returning to the rough, laborious and sometimes shaky ground of human language and its conditions. But can philosophy through language lead us toward this return? Let me put the question this way. At paragraph 107, Wittgenstein has this. We have to got in onto the slippery ice where there is no friction and so in a certain sense, the conditions are ideal. But also, just because of that, we are unable to walk. We want to walk, then we need friction back to the ground, the rough ground. There is a slightly concealed conditional in the penultimate sentence of his remark. Making it explicit, the sentence reads, if we want to walk, then we need friction. I take this passage to suggest that in a condition which seem seems ideal, we will only recognize our need for friction. If we want to or come to walk, If we want to or come to want to walk, similarly, we will only recognize our need for the rough ground. of human language and its conditions if we desire or come to desire humanity meaning and intelligibility
but can philosophy through language activate in us this redemptive desire Can Wittgenstein's language activate this desire? Perhaps it can, at least in part, by showing us that we do not know now at least not steadily, desire humanity, meaning and intelligibility. By showing us that and how we are driven to deny them and so to deprive ourselves of them. But how exactly will showing us these things help? How will the language of Wittgenstein's text affect a transformation in us toward the acceptance of our human conditions, even if a transformation that lasts only as long as each moment of productive engagement with the text itself. It is often remarked and often dismissed character of the writing and composition in philosophical investigations simply a matter of style. And that ends my reading of Stephen Athol's excellent article, Captivating Pictures and Liberating Language. Let's have a look, see at some sites here. The very first paragraph we read at 276, it needs just to be mentioned that Thomas or Thomas Nagel wrote a whole book about the lion, but it's not a lion in his book, it's a bat. It's an excellent exposure of this problem. And it's, we would never know what it is to be a bat. That can only be known by a bat. And it's 
solving some of the consciousness problems that I think in this month are taking place as a conference somewhere in Arizona, headed by David Chalmers. It's an easy read and I can most definitely recommend it. But continuing on page 277, in the third paragraph, and we are like 12 lines down on the third, uh, third paragraph, Now you're into the fourth paragraph. You need to go up to the third one. Uh, the idea that sense is an atmosphere that accompanies a word as well as the closely related idea that language operates with pictures which carry their own meaning are not, and this is important, for Wittgenstein simply philosophical mistakes. No, rather, they are fantasies which express our desire. In particular, Wittgenstein's treatments of these ideas reveals them to be specific manifestations of a desire to escape or to repudiate the human conditions of meaning and intelligibility in language that I've been sketching. So we want, we know that something's wrong and we need to escape. And we go further down the rabbit hole or we go into the platonic cave. We know how much Plato suffered in his life. The same was also true about Augustine. His words stopped, stopped to work and he started to repeat himself and using empty concepts. He was no longer able to go into language or to understand his own speech. So somewhere we know that we lost understanding of language. Somewhere within ourselves that is deeply felt. It's in our guts. And we try to fix ourselves. I think a modern expression for that is self-medication, usually in the negative sense of medicining, uh, medicining in a wrong way, using drugs or uncalled for med methods. Philosophy in many cases are the same thing. It's very clear that there is desperation in most Western philosophers. I think <laughs> Bertrand Russell is the most blatant example. What torture he was living through, changing his philosophical direction 
half a dozen or a dozen or several dozens of times. Can you imagine the pain? That's worse than torture. And that is true desperation. Something Wittgenstein saw in Russell and saw it as a defect or uh, a sort of horrific condition. You can see this further if you go to the next page, 278, if you please, Caleb. So what happens when we lost language, meaning and understanding? Uh, it's a rather scary description of it. We become lost to ourselves in confusion, emptiness, and unintelligibility. First, we captivate ourselves through our repetitive efforts to produce this picture of language and to fix it before ourselves through our incessant repetition of this picture to ourselves through our making ourselves captive to the construction of this picture we come to feel as though the picture holds us captive, as though we cannot get outside of it. And this we mentioned earlier in the article that we seek out the picture to a degree ourselves. Second, the picture that we work to give ourselves, a picture intended to secure meaning and intelligibility in language beyond, and listen now, beyond or apart from our human conditions of meaning and intelligibility, precisely undermines the possibility of meaning and intelligibility. So it's in the act of trying to secure meaning, make it monosemic, to fixate it, something that captured modern academia, and as we saw earlier in the article, modern theology that is actually producer of despair. Our action to bring the picture to life is caused by our deeply felt desire to fix everything and our torturous situation of not being able to understand our own thoughts. And this is, of course, also the cosmological fallacy pointed out by Mr. Lee Smolin and Roberto Unger, when in the deep desire of cleansing everything and going out away from the rough surface of language, we make ourselves transparent, take away the observer, obliterate ourselves as Jacques Menaud demanded. <laughs> then we lose everything. Then it's like taking away the liturgy of the Christian tradition. We rip the heart out of everything. We rip the meaning. We rip the conditions, the doings, so that words 
can no longer mean anything. And as we see here, for severing the connection between our words and our individual purposes, our individual purposes, in using those words in particular circumstances, you can call it the point, the wits, our need, it leaves our words in a specific sense empty. But they are not devoid of dictionary meaning, but they are powerless to say anything. So it's our intelligence that is caught up in some aspects of language. There's nothing wrong with language, but it does, it's our bewitchment of certain aspects. And I think this is very similar to uh, some severe autistic can be. Uh, I read about an autistic many years ago and he was fixated on pylons, those things that keep electricity wires up. Well, they are beautiful and very odd looking, I can agree. So to a certain extent, I can understand why you get at least interested in pylons. But he wanted to see them everywhere. It became a fixation. So it's the too much that is the problem. At the very end of this page, let me put the question this way. At paragraph 107, Wittgenstein has this We have to got onto slippery ice where there is no friction. And so in a certain sense, the conditions are ideal. But also just because of that, we are unable to walk. We want to walk. Then we need friction back to the rough ground. So in our mistaken belief, we look for frictionless ground. No observer, no culture, history, tradition, no movement. How we do things doesn't matter anymore. It is just the frictionless icy road where we slip backwards constantly. And to continue, there is a slightly conceit conditional in the penultimate sentence of this remark. Making it explicit, the sentence reads, if we want to walk, then we need friction. He is showing us back to meaning and sense. No wonder Wittgenstein was the last spiritual person of the 20th and the 21st century, as testified by many. He did it. For instance, he gave away, he gave away maybe the biggest fortune in Europe at the time, his family inheritance to good purposes. He wouldn't be doing that. He wouldn't have done that if he didn't believe that the reality was good. In sharp contrast to uh, that desperate feeling that often leads to aggression, uh, we know it led to this horrible misuse in the churches and in the monasteries, a quite new thing. Uh, complete sects like uh, that, that have been evolving since late 19th century and just been misusing people. That's a new term. 
that desperation leads to violence also. But if you lost your language, how can you blame anyone? Because the worst is you don't even understand yourself. And uh, I think uh, it's excellent Thomas Nagel here, what it is like to be a bat. You become someone who don't understand himself. You become something else. And there is no understanding anymore. Just an eerie feeling that you want to get back to meaning. You need to fix it. And I think I completely agree here. I think here is a family resemblance, if not more, with Ian McKinkrits. This is closely connected to the development of schizophrenia, autism, HDHD with the start a couple of centuries ago and the death of academia that we see maybe in the 20th century, the closing of the intellectual mind as we have it. When I went to university, I had only desperate professors and they mentioned explicitly there is no knowledge to be gained here. They were wrong but they were living that life themselves. They would never find any meaning in that direction they went. Wittgenstein is showing us that direction. And I think that is pretty obvious through the whole article. Caleb, please. <clears throat> Let's, um, let me also comment on this uh, phrase, the con. Um, the picture that we work to give ourselves, a picture intended to secure meaning and intelligibility in language beyond apart from human conditions of meaning and intelligibility, precisely undermines the possibility of meaning and intelligibility. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> it's not that uh, a bit case is against pictures. Um, so we, we can say pictures, we can divide them perhaps in two categories. Uh, there are the material objects like a picture, a uh, drawing, a painting, a museum object, and then the picture that you can have in your mind, like uh, imagination. And for, it, uh, for all the artists, but also the scholars, imagination is a very good, it's actually a tool. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. but where is the but? It doesn't constitute, a, it does not constitute a move in the language game, as we have seen in this paper by Stephen Affelt. Yeah, very good, Kali. I see. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So you can uh, you can be Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo Vinci, but if you don't put it in action, you can have great pictures in your mind, but if you don't actually paint, and the very painting that you take as action is a move in the language game. Otherwise, a picture is idle. As it's idle, yeah, yeah. I, well, yeah was just, see, pictures passive, are passive, yeah. passive, passive, passive. So you need observer. Um, and uh, uh, we can mention beyond and apart from our human conditions. We have we had the phrase of the Martian, uh, as we remember. Um, so we can let, let us repeat this phrase. I think it's very useful. Um, I found 139 in uh, philosophical investigations. I see a picture. It reps an old man walking up a steep path, leaning on a stick. How might it not have looked just the same if he had been sliding down in the position? Perhaps a Martian would describe the picture so. I don't need to explain why we don't describe it so. And so uh, this is uh, um, pictures don't have a meaning themselves. Pictures are idle, passive. Uh, so you need to observe uh, to make the uh, to create meaning. Yes, exactly. You need the observer, and he puts a concept, a word, a context to it, and an intention, a point, and then we get it, and everything sort of flowers or blooms. Would, would you agree on mm. that? 
Yes, absolutely. We need an observer. What, what did you say? We need a we need an observer. Yeah, he he brings he brings in the intention, the concept, the word, uh, the friction, of course. Yeah, the uh, yeah. Because if you imagine, uh, imagine only things, uh, you don't have any friction. But it, because everybody can imagine things, and you need the friction. Friction is the hard work, the move, the move in the language game. You need actually to take the pen and to work hard, hard, hard. You need, you need to put it on paper. You need to uh, do go down to the nitty gritty and com compare that uh, life death. We had, uh, I think I'm going to mention Jacques Monod. He, he writes explicitly in his famous book, I want to eradicate myself. <laughs> <laughs> and every good scientist should eradicate himself. All traits of personality. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing but scary. And Wittgenstein shows that uh, Monod tried to get meaning, but he looked at meaning, looked for meaning in the wrong way, in the wrong position. Absolutely. And let me only, uh, let me think here. Um... Uh, yes, this, this has been one of the key phrases of the paper. Philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. So, as uh, Affet shows, there are two possible ways to interpret this. It depends how you really put by means of language. Philosophy is a battle by means of language against the bewitchment of our intelligence. Or uh, is it like in this uh, sense? So, is, a, is language an enemy or is it a friend? And for uh, Affert, language is a friend. Uh, oh, yeah. It yeah. He, he defends language. language. I think he defends language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Personally, uh, personally, I say it's both. Uh, Alan is both a friend and enemy, and I think you could uh, uh, find arguments in which case for both positions. And I think that both positions are equally good, but I respect Affert's. Uh, Appreciation of language, which goes against Plato's view of language. Mm. For Plato, language was something negative. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's end there, Hans. Well, thank you very much. It was a fantastic paper, this. Uh, uh, Stephen G. Affelt is sharp like a kitchen knife from a Japanese restaurant. It's beyond belief. And that specification for me with the lion was very important. Although, as you said, the example wasn't the best. Uh, understanding that it's not the words, it's not that the lion speaks in a different way. It is just that its life world is different. And I can imagine it could actually be a, a tribesman from some Amazonian uh, uh, habitat somewhere in the Amazon basin or somewhere. It could also be so different as we could not understand it. Uh, so um, thank you very much to following in this marvelous text, Kalle. Thank you as always for your excellent you. comments and to bring the subject further. And also, thank you very much, all you, for listening in on these uh, long and, of course, very strenuous go-throughs. But your patience is well worth it. It's one of the reasons we do this. And it's also help, very helpful in the progress. So thank you. Everyone, have a very good morning, good day, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. And until next, goodbye.